So we'll go ahead and um, get started. I'm, I'm going to start by saying uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Suzanne Cohen. I'm the Managing Artistic Director of Mirror Stage. And I want to thank you all for joining us for our September 2nd Saturday, which is our gun control pre-show lecture. Uh, so we want to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish and Coastal Salish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish and Coastal Salish tribes. We would also like to thank For Culture, the City of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, Arts Wa, the EPS Fund, and the Posner Wallace Foundation for their support in helping make this programming possible. Um, just as a reminder of what the timeline for the event will be, uh, we're starting at 5 p.m. We're letting people in from the waiting room now. And uh, so starting the greetings and introductions, and then Margaret will present a lecture on the history of gun violence and gun control in the United States. And then we'll have um, some time for an audience Q&A, and then we will end the event. Um, so how this event came about and uh, the, why we asked Margaret to present a pre-show lecture is this is a pre-show lecture for our Expand Upon series. Um, and for the Expand Upon series, the community selects a theme and then Mirror Stage commissions two local playwrights to each write a short piece using the same cast of actors responding to the theme. And so for this, which is our fifth round, of Expand Upon, the community selected the theme gun control, and we commissioned Memory Bus by Amontane Aurora and In My Good Christian Neighborhood by Sienna Mendez. And the performances are in October, the uh, October 3rd and 4th, and October 10th and 11th, and they will be online because it's, it's not safe to gather in person yet, and we hope that once restrictions are lifted and we reach uh, safe start phase four, that we will do a festival of live performances at that point. Um, but so as part of our Expand Upon series, we do a, um, an activism brunch, which we had presented in April of this year because originally the performances for Expand Upon were scheduled for May. And Margaret was one of our panelists for the activism brunch and um, we invited her to um, present the pre-show lecture. And since everybody is experiencing some Zoom fatigue, uh, at this point we didn't want the events, the performance events to be so, so very long on Zoom. So we're doing the pre-show lecture this month and then the performances next month. Um, so a couple more people have joined us now. Um, but, uh, so I will, read my little introduction for Margaret. Um, Margaret Heldring, PhD, is the co-chair of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, a retired clinical psychologist. She served as clinical faculty in the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine, as healthcare legislative assistant to former US Senators Bill Bradley and Paul Wellstone, as a senior policy advisor on Bill Bradley's presidential campaign, and as the founder and executive director of the national nonprofit, America's Health Together. She delights in being a thriving grandmother and we are thrilled to have her joining us and uh, to present our pre-show lecture. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. Oh, actually, I'm sorry for that. Uh, go over um, just uh, so for, if you wanna make sure that you are not seeing the non-video participants on your screen. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, um, on the left, there's a camera, and then there's, a, I mean, I'm sorry, on the left, there's a, a microphone at the bottom of your screen um, uh, that should say mute or unmute under it, and then there's a camera that uh, should have a little arrow next to it. If you click on the arrow, it should bring up a little window um, for you to select your camera, to choose your virtual background, or video settings. And so if you click on video settings, and then under meetings, there's an option to hide non-video participants. And you wanna make sure that that box is checked. And then you can close your settings box and make sure that you are not seeing 
the non-video participants. You also have the option of choosing speaker view, which will only show the person who is speaking, or you can choose gallery view, which shows everybody. So if you have it in gallery view, then right now you would see both Margaret and me on your screen. If you have it in speaker view, you would only be seeing me um, with Margaret in a little, little box at the top. Um, so I would encourage you to select speaker view so that you will have Margaret on full screen once I stop speaking and turn my camera off. Um, there is a chat box uh, where you can um, write your questions. Uh, we won't be answering them until the Q&A. Um, you Okay, so I see somebody's asking a question about being able to chat with individuals. And I believe we had turned that option off. Um, sorry, let me just, yeah, we don't have that. Yeah, the way the meeting is, is set up, it's um, only public chats, so that you're not able to chat with individual attendees. Um, so again, so, so know that the questions that you post in the chat box will be public, will be viewable to everyone, um, and we will get to the questions and address the questions. Um, and our external relations associate and Kiki, our program assistant, will be uh, monitoring the chat as well and making sure that we don't miss any questions. Um, so again, with that now, I will turn it over to Margaret. And again, thank you for joining us. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for inviting me back for recognizing Grandmothers Against Gun Violence and including us in this program. And I'm taken with your comment that we may all have a pretty good case of Zoom fatigue. I, I think that is probably true. But I'm also, as I listen to you give the instructions and provide this information, marveling at how Zoom fluent we have become over the past four or five months. Words like Zoom, chat room, <laughs> um, different kinds of screens. I don't think any of us knew. I'm not even sure it existed four or five, six months ago. So it's remarkable how we have been required to adapt and how well people have adapted. I also, Suzanne, want to thank you and all of Mirror Stage for keeping a focus on this public health epidemic of gun violence and helping the public become more and more aware of how pervasive a problem this is, what the impact of this problem is on individuals, families, communities, how this problem varies from community to community, and probably most importantly, how we can look together collectively to not only solutions, but also prevention of gun violence. So on behalf of all of grandmothers and all of us working in the gun violence prevention movement, we are deeply grateful to organizations such as yours that feature this problem. That's especially true these days as we are confronted with so many different challenges in our lives at this point. And I, I know I do not need to list them, but let's just put the air quality and the fires and the changes in our climate uh, back on the list, regrettably. And it's just yet another thing we're all having to adapt to and quote with, cope with today. On the subject of the fires, and then I will get to gun violence, on the subject of the fires, I actually deeply appreciated Governor Inslee's comments today that we should not call these wild fires, we should call these climate fires so that we understand and are reminded of really what is causing this devastation across our state, Oregon, California, and who knows where, what other states may get caught up in this with time. 
So with that background, I also want to uh, acknowledge that I see on the gallery screen that there are quite a few people attending today that are current board members of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. That is a measure of their commitment to this issue. I have to say that I have never seen a harder working, more dedicated, kind of chokes me up actually right now, board than the Board of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, which is both an advocacy group, a research support group, and an education group. So here we are Saturday afternoon at 515, and there are a lot of board members who are working late today. I also see that there are past members of the Board of Grandmothers, welcome to you. I think once you are a member of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, you are always a member. And for sure, once you understand the magnitude of this movement, it's impossible to leave it. We have members of Grandmothers on board. Marcy, hello. And, and um, it, it is so great to have people here who are, again, just like the board members, deeply committed. Linda, hello. And we have a member of Moms Demand Action here. Hi, Jane Weiss, who may, many of you may know was honored last year with one of uh, Senator Patty Murray's Golden Tennis Shoes Award for her great work on behalf of gun violence survivors and, and the whole movement. And, and seeing Jane and thinking about Moms Demand Action, I think one of the first things I'd like to say, I have two things actually I want to sign in with before I, I move directly to my remarks. One is I'm going to let you all in on a little secret, even if you don't know this already, and many of you do. We've really dropped the term gun control. And we talk in terms of a couple different, of this issue, a couple different ways. We haven't really settled on a um, principal name. We talk about common sense gun reform. We talk about gun safety. We talk about gun violence prevention and reduction. We talk about gun violence harm, and it would be a, a, just a great thing to, to understand that control, it turns out, no surprise, was a, a kind of a bad choice of words, but a loaded term, and uh, kind of triggered bad choice of words, but it also reveals how pervasive language about guns is in our society, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but it, it invites the adversarial oppositional approach, uh, because much of the argument of the gun rights supporters is that we gun violence prevention people are trying to control them and control their ownership of guns. So that's just a, a, you know, a little secret for you to know. The other thing I wanna say right up front is seeing Jane reminds me that one of the great strengths of this movement, and it is a movement, and a strength I hope that will continue to grow and have an impact, is that it's a multi-generational movement. We've certainly seen the students who really surfaced and emerged as a force after the shooting at Parkland in Florida. We've seen that here in Seattle, March for Our Lives, students from different high schools around the city, we at Grandmothers had a panel of students that were 15, 17 years old that just knocked our socks off. So we have young people. We have the moms, uh, which is so interesting that the moms group grew up at exactly the same time Grandmothers did. Both groups were um, inspired, devastated by the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School and just popped up into our social fabric. And then of course, here we are grandmothers, the older group, the older cohort in this group. And I would also say, and it's true for me personally, that many of the grandmothers and probably some of the mom, many of the moms too, are finding that their grandchildren or their children are picking up on this. My grandson, my oldest grandchild has come with me now to two marches and is very proud of that, has come to Olympia to observe uh, testimony on gun violence prevention legislation and toured around. And you know, this could have a lasting impact. It'll be very interested to see how these young people watching their parents and grandparents, what they do as they move into their adult citizen roles. I am hoping that they are being instilled with a sense of citizenship and activism that will serve our country well. 
So I am thrilled to be back here and thank you. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the legal background to gun safety legislation in our country, taking a bit of a historical approach. I should preface this by saying I am not an attorney. So if there are any legally based questions that come up, I could make a good guess, but I, I'm not the professional that could answer those questions. I'd like then to talk and speculate a little bit. Maybe we can do more of this in the Q&A. How did we become such a gun culture in this country? What, what is this all about? And what are the origins of this gun culture in, in this country? I think it's, maybe it's because I am a psychologist and I'm always looking at root causes and origins and how did this come to be? I think it's important for us to understand that, not only because it may point us in the direction of insight and remedies, but it may also point us in the direction of greater understanding and greater empathy with gun rights activists and gun owners. Because on neither side of this debate, and there are unfortunately still two sides, on neither side of these of this debate are there all bad people or all rigid people or all people who are uh, dismissive of the other side. I'll talk a little bit later about an initiative that Grandmothers is going to embark on that hopefully will begin to build a bridge be between these, these two sides. So let me begin by saying a couple things about the nature of guns and gun violence in America. The debate around guns is really about the civilian ownership and use of guns. We do not address law enforcement, well, we do now address law enforcement, but in terms of gun ownership, um, that has not been a mainstream issue for us because of the racial injustices and police brutality associated with guns, we certainly are paying attention to it now. We do not really focus on the, the military um, relationship with guns. That, that's also kind of off the table. What we are focused on is civilian gun ownership, and I would add to that civilian gun use. And I think it's always helpful and somewhat startling to learn that the U.S. civilians own 393 million firearms. 35 to 42% of households in our country own one or more gun. Grandmothers is proud to have provided financial research support to the University of Washington School of Public Health to take a look at gun ownership and safe storage of guns and ammunition in Washington state and found that about one third of the households in the United, in Washington state acknowledge having one or more guns in the household. And of that one third, two thirds acknowledge not storing their guns or ammunition safely. That is an enormous risk factor for what we call unintentional injuries and deaths and tragedies. But that's a lot of guns. We have in the highest per capita ownership of guns in the world. There are 120.5 guns in this country for every 100 people. There are 36,000 deaths each year in the neighborhood of 30, 36,000 deaths each year from guns. 20% of Washington state gun violence victims are black. And on the subject of police shootings, there have been only 12 days in the year 2020, this odd year, when the police have not killed somebody. So I hope on hearing these numbers, it's not that I want us to focus necessarily on numbers, but I want us to focus on what they tell us about who we are and what our dynamics are around gun ownership in this country, in this world. They are challenging 
and they are serious. And there are times, and I'm sure other grandmother board members would confirm this, when we can have a sense or, or be told, my gosh, you know, you'll, you'll never, you can never make progress. The horse is out of the barn. The horse is way out of the barn. The situation has expanded and become such that it's impossible to call back the number of guns in the country. It's impossible to really turn this huge boat ship around. I argue with that. I don't believe that. I am humble that it's going to take more time than eight years ago when grandmother started, than we thought it would at the beginning. But I am now convinced that a movement does change things in this country. And I often like to say that when there are more people in the gun violence prevention movement than out of the movement, that's when it will really change. It will also really change when we see sociocultural changes. Right now, a lot of our focus has been around legal changes, legislative changes, new laws that help manage this pervasive ownership and use in our country. But when it becomes a new norm, when it becomes uncool to have a gun in your home without storing it safely, with, to have ammunition in your home without storing it safely, when it becomes uncool to walk around in what we call open carry with your gun at your side or across your, uh, your AR-15 strapped across your chest, when it becomes uncool to do, do those things the way it's, you know, pretty uncool to smoke cigarettes now, it's really uncool to ride your bike without a bike helmet, it's totally uncool to get in your car without fastening your seatbelt. When that day comes for how we view, treat, own, manage guns, we will make some really good progress because laws can come and go. And so, so can social norms, but they have a, a kind of a deeper rootedness in our society. So let me say a few things about the legal background to our gun situation. And I, I begin with the year 1791. And the good news is <laughs> we're not going year by year, but in 1791, the Second Amendment, along with the other bills of right, Bill of Rights Amendments was approved. And I'm going to read it to you because it has been the basis for so much of the legal controversy, so much of the public controversy. It is such a divisive set of words, open to convenient interpretation that I think we should all know about it. So the Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now the debate around the Second Amendment, and maybe many of you have read books or articles or listened to far more learned people than I am debate this, has a lot to do with, is the Second Amendment a collective right or is the Second Amendment an individual right? So there have been seven major Supreme Court cases interpreting this Second Amendment. And most of them have been on the side of, <clears throat> excuse me, the right of people to, to bear arms. But in 2008, that's when we saw, from our point of view, the gun violence prevention movement point of view, our biggest setback, excuse me, that was the Heller decision. And that was written by Judge Scalia. And he and the majority that supported this ruling determined that that Second Amendment language guarantees an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with any service in a militia. So it separated out the notion of a well-regulated militia needing to bear arms versus the individual's right to bear arms. Before the, the earlier decisions had kind of sort of tilted in the direction of this is really about um, 
a, a militia. This is about a group. This is about being able to uh, protect a group. Now it became about an individual, and that decision was predicated on the notion that guns are needed in the home for the purpose of self-defense. And let me just jump ahead to say, bluntly, that's baloney. And the reason we know that's baloney is that the little research that's been done on the problem of gun violence over the last 25 years clearly establishes that guns in the home are, pose a far greater risk for suicide, for domestic violence, and for these accidental, unintentional shootings that I described. Far greater likelihood that one of those three things is going to take place than the need to use a gun in self-defense. Now, I've heard some very compelling testimony in Olympia over the last years by, as, as I have to say, especially by women who say, you know, I, I need my gun in my house. I am fearful at times. I, I do wonder what would happen if an intruder came to my house. You know what, I'm a woman. Many of us on, on this Zoom this afternoon are women. We can probably on some level understand that. And, and so there is this, that's one of the things that I look forward to talking to with grandmothers who are on the gun rights side of this, trying to, to kind of unpack that a little bit, trying to get to a deeper level of what is that really about? And are there other alter alternatives to the feeling of safety and self-protection than a gun? And how about safe storage? And about, um, you know, developing a set of clear kind of policies, personal home-based policies on gun ownership and gun use. But nonetheless, the important thing I'd like you to hear is that in 2008, the Supreme Court came down on the side of the individual right to own a gun, separate from any participation in a collective effort, and rational, provided the rationale that it was for the purposes of self-defense. So that is a very brief overview. The question that comes up next is, where did all this gun culture come from? What are the origins of this in our country? And most people who are beginning to reflect on this and the whole emergence of the gun violence prevention movement in the last eight years has been a re-emergence. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But people who are reflecting on this point out that we were an agrarian society before we were an industrial society, of course. And guns were a part of households. Guns were a part of obtaining food. Guns were safety from predatory animals. Guns were an accompaniment as exploration took place. And guns were a source of pride in many families. There were, it was a rite of passage to train most likely a son, maybe also a daughter. Uh, it was most, it, to train a child in the proper use of a gun and for a young person to kind of grow up and arrive at the point in their maturation and development where they could have a gun. It, it, it's a deeply old and embedded tradition in many parts of our country and among many people in our country. We can go into homes, and I think there are people on this Zoom who know this, and find a, a treasured old antique gun that belonged to someone's great-great-grandfather. And it has a place in that home and in that family story, much the way a beloved photo album would, or a recipe would, or a, some, a photograph on, on the wall. It, it is part of that story. And we have never been able to really um, come to a common point of respect on understanding that. And I, I, I think that that would be a breakthrough opportunity for us. We also then have, of course, in our society, this great notion of pushing west, of exploration, of a kind of individual-based um, merit and, and courage and bravery to go out into the wilderness, this kind of Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Lewis and Clark uh, concept of 
we, you know, we go out and we acquire new things and new places and we tame these, these unknown wild forces. And guns for many, many people were and have been a necessary implement, a necessary tool to, to do that in a way. Then guns are so wrapped up also in this, and this is a more contemporary view, in this concept of liberty and personal freedom. And that is one of the things that the NRA now, thankfully, on a downslide, but it is one of the things that the NRA built up quite effectively, linking guns with personal liberty. No one is gonna tell me what I can and cannot do. We're seeing that actually play out a little bit these days with masks. People who, I am not gonna wear a mask. Uh, you know, I don't need to do that. It's that same uh, individualism, that, that thread of individualism that runs through our society that places a greater value on my individual rights than on the shared public good, than on the collective approach. I think there are people who are beginning to really look at, and I don't know enough about this to go into detail yet, but to really look at guns as tied up in our Western notions of, of masculinity. And maybe what I've said so far um, kind of suggests that, but I don't know, uh, you know, that the work is too far along, yet I think it makes some intuitive sense. It has a certain appeal. Uh, I think those of us who are grandparents or of a certain age in our 70s or 80s, you know, we certainly grew up with uh, kind of notions of Roy Rogers or, or Davy Crockett or, um, you know, people where the, the, the brave, bold men were gun-carrying individuals. So I, I, I only offer this as some food for thought, some speculation on the oldest origins, oldest roots of our gun culture. But our more contemporary gun culture has been absolutely fueled by the NRA, by the gun manufacturers, by the capacity of, of the NRA to essentially um, fund political initiatives and to fund politicians. So what has moved, what has moved is originally a kind of necessary tool to survive in a new land, to something that came to represent family, tradition, to um, maybe a rite of passage kind of thing, to some notions about identity, has now become a hugely profitable industry supporting gun manufacturers and a lot of people whose mission it is to protect the rights of gun owners in our political life. So let's come a little closer to Washington State for a moment and, and talk about that. The gun violence prevention movement, and this leads to Washington State, has been a succession of, of fresh starts and kind of quiet periods, and then a fresh start again. For example, we saw after the attempted assassination on President Reagan and Jim Brady, we saw the birth of the Brady campaign. We saw uh, legislation on the federal level that, that took on guns, especially assault weapons. We saw a flurry of activity that was around educating people. And even the NRA at that point had a strong mission around gun safety training and the proper use of guns. And it looked like we could possibly, you know, break through to something quite positive, but it didn't happen. It all quieted down with one or two exceptional pieces of legislation, such as an assault weapons ban bill um, spearheaded by California Senator Dianne Feinstein that unfortunately was sunsetted after it had been in existence for 10 years. But we, we basically saw a very quiet period until the shooting on December 14th, 2012, at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, where 26 people lost their lives. And that event was so, and remains, so powerful, 
had such imagery with it involved completely innocent children, not that anybody is ever deserving, but completely innocent children, teachers, employees at the school, that people were galvanized into early action. And the gun violence prevention movement entered a new chapter, entered, entered a new phase. And the good news about this phase is now eight years old, it's making a difference, and it shows no signs of weakening. So after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, Moms Demand Action popped up, Grandmothers Against Gun Violence popped up, different grandparent groups around the country. There's a group called Grandmothers Against Gun Violence on Cape Cod that was born at the exact same time. We were entirely independent of each other, but we know each other now. There is a group in Kansas and Missouri now called Grandparents against gun violence because the men came knocking at the door and said, we care too. We want to raise our voices as well. And this movement has found both incredible challenges, but also created amazing opportunities. And I want to take a moment here, and, and Jane, this is something I know that you'll relate to and maybe want to speak to in the Q&A. One of the main reasons this movement has been successful and will be is the unbelievable courage and generosity of people who lost a family member or a loved one to gun violence to speak out and to come tell their stories. When we were working Washington State, when we were working on the first initiative we did, Initiative 594, to close the loophole on background checks on guns. It was that if you bought a gun at a gun show or you bought a gun online, you didn't have to go through a background check. Well, imagine what a problem that was. When we got put that initiative out, led by the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, also a brand new organization at that time, two parents who had just lost their children two years earlier at Sandy Hook, their six-year-old children, flew out to Seattle and went to work with us and did press events and went doorbelling with us as we handed out literature. It has happened again where a father who lost his son at a shooting in Southern California, where a father whose son was deeply injured in Mukilteo, where parents who lost their daughter at the Aurora Colorado Movie Theater have all come to Seattle or are from this area and have chosen to speak out. This past legislative session, we had parents who lost a child at the Pulse nightclub. We've, we've, it's from all over the country. That, I cannot, I cannot overstate what a difference it makes for someone to come and sit before a group of lawmakers, a legislative committee, the media, and tell their personal story. And one look at someone's face, one look at someone's eyes, into someone's eyes, you have a you acquire a new and more immediate understanding of this problem. The other reasons that this has been successful is and will continue to be successful is the great leadership of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. They have really been the ones who worked on framing the three initiatives that have successfully passed Washington State. They have organized, been a, a leader in organizing our legislative agendas. And then related to that, we all work together very well. Grandmothers, moms, the Alliance, faith-based communities, all the different groups that have, that have gone to work on this. So what are these three initiatives? Just by, I'm sure it's a refresher course for everybody. The first, as I mentioned, was background checks. Um, making sure that everyone who purchases a gun has to uh, be cleared of certain rule out things such as a felony and um, a history of domestic violence. The second initiative had to do with what we call ERPO, Extreme Risk Protection Orders, which basically are also known as red flag laws giving law enforcement and individual family members the right to petition a court to have a gun removed temporarily from someone who is found to be at risk 
to harm themselves or to somebody else. This law has been, it is now law, has been, um, you know, a little slow starting because it's kind of a complicated concept. And yet it's already made a difference in saving some lives. And we have worked with people who lost a family member whom they knew to be at risk, but they couldn't get the gun away from that person. I also want to just mention really briefly here that um, one of the key national groups, I was talking largely about Washington State and national before, but key national groups that is making such a difference is Every Town for Gun Safety. And this is a group that's largely, I believe, funded still by Mike Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York and short-term Democratic presidential candidate. Um, and this group has a very well-developed survivors network, bringing people who have been victims of gunshots, wounds, or have a loved one who was lost to or severely injured, bring, again, bringing these stories out to the forefront. So, you know, hats off to all, all these different groups. But ERPO, red flag laws, we need to do a lot more public education about what they are and how to access that, but they are making a difference. The most recent initiative was 2018, Initiative 1639, that had a number of different components to it. And we've got some really good news about this, which is shortly after the initiative passed, uh, the NRA and local groups such as the Sec Second Amendment Foundation filed a lawsuit challenging this, the constitutionality of it, drawing again on that earlier Supreme Court, Supreme Court case, Heller, that I mentioned, as well as some other com variables in there. And I think it was not 10 days ago, I think it was August 31st, so 12 days ago, that the judge ruled in our favor. And 1639 has been upheld. And that, I, that is exciting. Those are the moments, you know, when you're doing this work and you're a supporter and you're putting a lot of time and energy in it, you just go, yes, yes, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So part of the 1639 had to do with raising the age from 18 to 21 to be able to buy an assault weapon ban. Common sense gun reform is why we often use that term. Requiring uh, safe storage and setting up some legal penalties for the failure to store a firearm safely if that firearm is found to have been used in a tragic event. So setting up a, a kind of incentive for families to do a much better job because you, as you remember, we have learned that two thirds of the gun owning families in our state do not store their guns safely. So trying to set up some incentives for that. 1639 also requires some training uh, work for gun ownership and it expands on the background checks. Now, I've used the word initiative and I'm sure everybody knows exactly what that is, but just by way of reminder, that basically means the legislature didn't do it, so the people have had to do it. And one of the great impacts of these citizen-based, people-based initiatives has been giving the legislature and legislators um, cover and reason and kind of a kick to get going and to pass some legislation. And I, I'm pleased to say that that is happening. We are not where we would like to be. And you know we'll see what the 2021 session looks like. It's a budget session and every single state in this country certainly ours is overloaded with need at this point and i don't know what will be able to happen but we certainly want to work on a ban on assault weapons we want to work on a ban on high capacity magazines and to keep promoting what has been the, kind of the first common ground between the two sides of this argument and that has been around suicide prevention because an important thing to know is that gun-related suicides account for about two-thirds 
of all gun-related deaths. That usually comes as quite a surprise to people to realize that. So where we are now is thinking this spring, particularly, the, the tragic but painful and realistic fact of police shootings of unarmed black men, women, young people. We are focused largely on that. I think so many of us have learned over the past years, thanks to many of the black women involved and grandmothers, for example, how gun violence plays out differently in different communities. And we are thinking a lot about how we can grow in our understanding and grow in our mission and create organizations that have a heightened sensitivity and a heightened commitment to addressing all kinds of gun violence in all the different ways it expresses. And it does express in some fairly important ways to know. Suicide is one that I just, mentioned, I just mentioned, and that is the most common. Interpersonal gun violence, it could be a domestic violence situation. It could be a gang shooting. Um, there are probably other kinds that I'm, I'm not thinking of right now. There are, of course, the mass shootings, a mass shooting such as a school shooting or the nightclub or the movie theater or the Mother Emanuel Church, whatever setting it is, or a house party. Mass shootings are defined as shootings that involve four or more killed or injured people. There has been a 45% increase in mass shootings this year, 2020, compared to the same time last year. And that brings up the final point I'd like to, final one of two points I'd like to make today and then open it up for Q&A and discussion, is the relationship between the pandemic and guns, the relationship between the increased awareness of racial injustices associated with gun violence, the increase in the overall economic stress, displacement, demoralization that is occurring and the relationship to guns. We saw gun sales increase quickly as early as April and we are now seeing very sadly and in a very profoundly disturbing way an increased number of gun violence episodes. This does not in the long run dishearten those of us, I mean, it, that doesn't sound quite right, of course it disheartens us, but it doesn't deter us from our commitment to this work. Because as I said earlier, we now understand that this is a multi-year, if not even a multi-generational movement, but it is certainly, certainly worth it, of course. So my final thought is just to do a little, um, uh, shameless self-promotion for Grandmothers Against Gun Violence is one of the groups working so hard on this. We're very proud of our almost eight years and our place in the gun violence movement. And we are looking to expand our membership in Washington State so that we can have members in every legislative district prepared to lobby and advocate with their representatives. So even in parts of Washington that have been uh, slow to come around to the gun violence prevention movement, we hope we can get, get some people going. We have members in 31 different states and we're interested to learn more from them. We're committed to being a team player. We're committed to helping to make Washington state and beyond a safe and healthy space for all of our families and all of our communities. So thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, as my camera turns back on, um, that was very informative and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise uh, with us and the tremendous work that you and the grandmothers have been doing. 
um, and the difference that that has been making. Uh, we really are lucky to have you um, here with us and, and um, presenting that information. Um, I did realize uh, part of the way through that I forgot to mention to people that there was closed captioning available. Um, and so I only just turned it on uh, a few minutes ago um, here on the part uh, that I'm recording. So, uh, so apologies for not mentioning that earlier. But um, so it's, it's 5.52 now and uh, we'll go ahead. And the best way uh, I think to handle the chat, we'll start by looking at what's in the chat box. And then if you have a question that you would like to ask, um, you also can try clicking the raise your hand and we, we can then turn your um, camera and microphone on so we can all see you and, and hear the question that you have to ask. Um, but I, I noticed that uh, Jane was sharing some really wonderful information in the chat during the lecture and um, filling it, yeah, and also mentioning the air quality. Thank you, Jane. Um, but really some, yeah, filling in more information, um, some more details about every town for gun safety, um, and uh, and so about how any survivor can text survivor to six four four three three to join the network, um, and that offers resources to survivors in many areas, and that is fantastic. Uh, information that we will also be sharing and, and um, passing along through our social media um, and mentioning uh, Senator Chris Murphy's uh, new book, The Violence Inside of Us. And so again, those are, are really helpful. Um, are, there, are there other questions that people would like to ask Margaret? Um, if you, you can either choose to type it into the chat box or you can raise your hand and um, I will unmute you. Um, let's see if we can do that that way. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Well, I have a question that I'm sure people are wanting to ask. <laughs> if you are not already involved in the gun violence prevention movement, how can I get involved? <laughs> yes, I should be prepared for that as well. Okay. So I, I would say, as I mentioned, there are a number of Washington state-based groups that are doing outstanding work. There, Every Town for Gun Safety is here. Moms Demand Action is here. Grandmothers is here. Students are here. So just Google around your age group and uh, maybe your faith community is involved, many are, uh, and, and talk to your neighbors and friends. Uh, we see neighbors coming together to talk about visiting homes that have guns in them and how to talk about that, which is not an easy thing to do. So it can start with visit your next door neighbor and chat it up or, yeah. Yeah, our, uh, our other panelists at the Activism Brunch, um, we had the president of Washington Ceasefire, which is yeah. an organization, and uh, the communications director of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which is also very active. Um, and uh, I can share, uh, I can post in the chat the uh, files of the additional resources um, that we had pulled together um, that lists some of the organizations that also lists some other uh, books and resources. So I am going to go ahead and share those files uh, now. But so are there any other questions that people were wanting to ask uh, or have, have Margaret address? Doing double duty here. Uh, Looks the, like it's almost six o'clock on a Saturday night. <laughs> it is. Oh, so Janice, let me. Um, sorry, I'm, it's trying to, it's not letting. Um, Hazel, can you unmute Janice, please? Hazel, because I'm not, I'm 
it's not letting me do it as I'm trying to find the files to post. There we go. It works. Okay. Hi. Hi, Mar Margie. Nice to see you, and thank you very much. It was very informative. There is something that I don't understand, and, and right at the end, I've been hearing the same number that um, the percent that you mentioned, that there's a 45% increase in mass shootings during this time of pandemic, and I really don't get it. I don't, have you read anything? Do you understand, is it, is it stress, is it anger, or is there something more specific? I think it's that. I think it's stress. I think it's a disturbing permission to act out some hostile, angry, negative impulses. I think there's a kind of a contag contagion effect that happens. I really don't know beyond that. Those are early thoughts, though. It is very strange. I mean, it thinks it seems like in many other ways that we're reverting to our, our most um, uh, angry, uh, self-serving thoughts. I don't know how else to say it with, without being too uh, yeah. supportive about it, but it, it's, it's such a, I mean, it could be that it's lack of leadership, just plain lack of leadership, but it is something that that confuses me and it seems to be such an immediate response margaret do you have the statistics available on the increase in gun sales um during the pandemic because i know that they have sharply increased but i don't have the statistics well my friend jane just posted something very useful there yes yeah okay so 40 percent of the new purchases are first-time gun owners um, but do we know how, what percent, what percentage, uh, the, the increase in gun sales? I don't off the top of my head, but I could sure find it and pass it on to you too. Yeah. Maybe someone else knows. There are a lot of experts on this. Yeah. Cause that I know has been an astonishing amount. I mean, certainly here in Washington state, there has been a wow. huge jump in gun sales. Is that 40% number in Washington state? Uh, Jane would have to answer that. I don't know. That's a new fact to me. In the state, there's not a requirement. Yeah, it says, and in the state, there's not a requirement for training. Yeah. Um, well, so I posted the actions you can take form, and now I'm going to um, share just uh, the different ways to contact your legislature and um, okay, 40% of the new purchases are in this state. Um, and then the book resources and then the gun violence prevention and volunteer information. Oh, oops, that seems to have sent to Hazel. Not everyone, sorry. Uh, how did that change? Send to everyone. Uh, but so it is, it is six o'clock. Um, and so uh, again, I wanna, I'm gonna, um, so I'm gonna turn your camera back off, uh, Janice. Um, so I, I want to remind everyone that um, we are doing performances of our two plays, um, Memory Bus and In My Good Christian Neighborhood, as our Expand Upon Gun Control performances, uh, October 4th, uh, 3rd and 4th. Uh, so Saturday at 8 and Sunday at 2, and then the following Saturday at 8 and Sunday at 2 as well. And so both plays are, are presented in tandem, and then we have a discussion afterwards further expanding upon uh, the issues that are raised in the play and um, continuing the discussion. Um, and so uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us for this event. Um, there is information in the action you, actions you can take 
um, file that I shared in the chat that um, has the contact information for Grandmothers Against Violence and a number of the other advocacy organizations as well as um, shooting ranges for uh, gun safety classes and, and learning how to uh, operate, be a responsible gun owner um, as well. And um, you can purchase tickets uh, for our performances on our website at mirrorstage.org. And for us, uh, word of mouth, especially in these times, is uh, truly our best publicity. So um, we would love for you to tell your friends and family and colleagues. Uh, usually we say, you know, and people that you pass on the street, but with social distancing, that's so much more difficult right now. So um, please do encourage uh, the people that you know um, to, uh, to purchase a ticket, to join the conversation, to become engaged in advocacy efforts um, in helping improve gun safety. Um, it's such an important issue. And so again, Margaret, we wanna thank you again for the information, the knowledge and expertise uh, that you have shared with us here tonight. And we uh, hope that everybody stays safe and stays healthy. And we hope to see you in October. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.